So um, I think this, this is just to uh, sort of make a basis for, for, for discussion, I think. Uh, but I, I would like to try and qualify some of the statements that I've made now. Um, first of all, I think it is really important to make this distinction between changes in passive properties and changes in active properties. This is simplicity in, in reality. It's, it's really basic understanding because we have a muscle and that muscle has a resistance which is just determined by those two properties. It's passive properties which is all the connective tissue, it's all the elements inside the muscle spindles, uh, muscle fibers, and it's the active properties which is basically how many cross bridges uh, are being formed in that muscle by the activity uh, from the nervous system. That activity from the nervous system can then be coming through reflex mechanisms or it can be coming from voluntary activation or it can be coming from involuntary activation that the patient cannot be controlling but uh, which is not uh, precisely reflex mechanisms. All of that contributes to what we measure in the end. The difficult part is to distinguish these things and to really be able to say whether it's one or the other. The problem is that we can't really say that for sure and feel it with our hands unless we have some kind of measure whether there is electrical activity in the muscle which is a sign that there are active properties going on. Uh, I really believe that the whole idea, the whole concept that we should be able to feel that with our hands uh, is just plain wrong. Uh, and this is what we need to uh, uh, address, I think, by some uh, better method than uh, feeling it with our own hands. Now, distinguishing these different uh, symptoms, just coming back to what I said also before, we, we, we definitely have dystonia, paresis, ataxia, spasticity, which come from lesions of di these different uh, parts of uh, the brain, basically. Uh, they're all relatively close to each other, and you certainly see patients who have mixtures of all of these. Now, one thing which I think not many people are aware of, but which is actually, it has been known since 1967, basically. It's still not in the textbooks, which is kind of a surprise, uh, but what you should notice is that spasticity is not caused by lesion of the corticospinal tract. It is caused by lesion of indirect uh, pathways coming from the brainstem. They are controlled by the motor cortex, of course, uh, but it is not the direct pathway coming from the cortex to the spinal cord. It is the indirect pathways coming from the reticular nuclei, from the red nucleus, from the vestibular nuclei. There's quite a lot of evidence which uh, shows that. It goes, well, actually it goes back to 1940, but that study was completely forgotten until Lawrence and Kybels demonstrated it in 1968 in uh, animals. But then there's been quite a lot of human studies also since then demonstrating that you actually don't develop spasticity if you have a lesion of the corticospinal tract. It requires lesion additionally or instead of these indirect pathways uh, over here. Um, so the link between paresis and spasticity need not be there, which I think is also an important communication uh, to be 